Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number seven of the Homestead Journey podcast. Thanks again so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. I hope this podcast finds you well and warm. (laughs) It is very cold here in upstate New York, and it is that time of year. I'm not complaining at all, but it was a balmy five degrees this morning. According to the uh, thermometer in our car as I was driving my son to the local ski area where he was doing some training to be a to become a ski instructor, uh, the thermometer in my car, the digital readout said it was five degrees. And one of the things that I have learned is that you can tell how cold it is based on the crunch of the snow under your feet and that feeling that you get when your nose hairs, freeze to the inside of your nose. And I I had both of those this morning, crunchy snow and my nose hairs were froze to the inside of my nose. Now that may be too much information for you and I apologize, but that is uh, was our situation this morning. And so I hope this podcast does find you warm and well. So what's been going on on 3B Farm and Homestead this week? This is the Homestead Happening segment. This week, we actually took a couple of pigs uh, to two different processors. One was for a customer of ours. They bought a pig from us that we raised for them. And so I took that pig to the processor that we normally use, and we dropped that off. That actually went on Thursday. And uh, it was originally supposed to go Sunday evening, but because of the storm, that uh, was uh, coming in Sunday through Tuesday that I shared with you about last week, Uh, we rescheduled and I took it on Thursday. And then we took another one on Monday. There was a break in the storm and I was able to get that one up to a new processor. Uh, It's a USDA processor. And uh, so I loaded it up and took it up there. And quite frankly, both of them were the easiest loads that we have ever, ever had here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So I don't know whether or not we got lucky or whether or not we are getting good at this, <laughs> but uh, at least that was our experience this week. They both loaded very easily and unloaded very easily. And so we will be enjoying um, some fresh bacon and chops and ham and and uh, some more um, uh, fat and lard. And we have a customer that will be enjoying all of that from our American guinea hog. One of the things that did give me, um, I guess, a great sense of peace, (laughs) I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, going to a new processor, you know, always worried, um, you know, are are animals going to be treated well and do people know what they're, they're doing? Because the American guinea hog is a little bit of a different breed. It's a smaller breed. It's a large breed. It's not the big market hogs that a lot of people are used to dealing with from from a processing perspective. And what was awesome is when I backed my trailer up and the guy was looking at the pig right away, he recognized it as an American guinea hog and uh, was talking to me about the benefits of the American guinea hog and the lard and so on and so forth. And so I was very, very happy to hear that. Uh, Contrast that with where I, uh, the processor that I normally take, there were some new guys there that I'd never seen before, but the one guy thought it was a potbelly pig. So um, I, I'm not worried because I've I've had a number of pigs processed um, at, at the local 5A slaughterhouse, and I've been very, very happy with um, the work that they've done, and, and uh, the, the sausage in particular is just absolutely amazing. Um, but he, he didn't know that it was an American guinea hog, and the guy at the USDA place did. So I was very happy about that. Uh, Other things we've had going on here on on the homestead this week, it's really just been a lot of fighting the weather. Uh, The snowstorm that came in dumped uh, less than what they had forecasted. I think we ended up getting between 10 and 12 inches probably from Sunday through Tuesday. 
which was less than the 18 to 24 they had forecasted. But just south of us, a friend of ours from church, he was probably less than five miles away. He got, I think he said 22 or 24 inches and a town to the west of us got 30 some odd inches. So um, it was it was kind of an odd storm. Uh, yet a, another town that's to the west of us, a little a little bit farther north, they only got six inches. Uh, and, and, you know, so it was just, it was kind of odd how the storm came through, but, uh, it was the first major snowstorm of the season and, uh, it ended up working out well that the, uh, local ski areas were able to get open. Um, and so my son, when he was doing his training to be a ski instructor was actually doing it on snow. Whereas, uh, when I went through snowboard instructor training four or five years ago, we didn't have any snow when we were just I guess, making it up as we went along. So, but anyhow, so that's what's been going on here on the homestead. Uh, as, as winter settles in, things kind of slow down. I put the canners away and uh, I think we're, we're done with a lot of the canning for this season. And now we're starting to turn our, our, you know, our thoughts towards spring. And so I've been reading through the seed catalogs and sort of very getting excited about uh, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, that's kind of what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead this week. Now let's jump on over to the community corner. As I shared with you in episode number two, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what it means to be a homesteader. I tried to answer the question, what is homesteading? And in that I said that I think any content creator that's creating content with regards to homesteading wrestles with either directly or indirectly that question, what is a homesteader or what is homesteading? And this week, uh, Amy Dingman over at A Farmish Kind of Life, um, and, and certainly her podcast is, is probably needs no introduction to you. Uh, it's, it's much larger than mine, been around for several years now. Um, but she was wrestling with that question. Uh, one of her listeners had sent her an email and I guess the listener had been at a family get together and um, a, a family member, I believe it was an aunt, but I, I don't remember qu for sure, but I believe it was an aunt. doesn't matter. Um, as this listener was sharing with this aunt about the things that they had been doing and very excited about, you know, raising and growing some of her own food and so forth. The aunt patted her on the head and said something about, well, someday when you buy a big homestead and you become a big girl homesteader, you know, very condescending. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of us um, at one point or another have struggled with that because we have people, whether they're relatives um, or whether they're nameless, faceless people that we're dealing with online through Facebook or through some of the homestead forums, um, we have people who have been either critical or condescending or kind of have poo-pooed our choices in our lifestyle. And they kind of have, have questioned whether or not we are quote unquote, and I'm using huge air quotes here, uh, real homesteaders. But a cousin of mine posted a, a meme on Facebook with this quote, and I thought it was so fitting with regards to how to handle that level of criticism. And, and probably many of us will be more aware of this criticism, criticism, especially from family members, as we get together with people uh, throughout the holidays who we might otherwise not see during the rest of the year. And so there's probably a greater risk of us dealing with that criticism from people that we know and perhaps love, um, then and we might just feel that a little bit more at this time of the year. But the quote from my my cousin uh, that my cousin posted was this: "It said, don't worry about critic, don't worry about criticism from people that you wouldn't seek advice from." And this was a, a quote from Debo Swinney responding to Paul Feinbaum. Now, if those names don't mean anything to you, well, they really don't mean much to me either. But Debo Swinney is the head coach of the Clemson Tigers football team. And this Paul Feinbaum, I guess, is some kind of a commentator uh, on one of the sports channels. 
I don't follow college football, so quite frankly, neither one of them are names that I recognized. But I love that quote. You see, the head coach was responding to some criticism from this commentator. And what did he say? He said, don't worry about criticism from people that you wouldn't seek advice from. And I thought, how fitting is that with regards to homesteading? There are a lot of people who are well-meaning. <laughs> and some people, maybe they just want to cut people down to make themselves feel better. I don't know. I don't want to question their motives. But you have people who are well-meaning, and you have people who are ignorant, and you have people who are just plain old jerks. But don't worry about criticism from people that you wouldn't seek advice from. You see, folks, there are going to be a lot of people that try to derail you from your journey. They're going to think that you are, get you to, to question what you're doing, to try to get you to conform to the quote unquote American dream or the American style of living. Um, or what may, maybe you're from another country. We have people who are listening around the globe. And so maybe there's a particular style of living that people in your country are trying to get you to conform to. Uh, they're trying to get you to, to live their story and to walk their journey. But your story isn't their story. Your journey isn't their journey. And so you need to focus on your path. You need to focus on the things that are important to you and not get worried about what they think. And, and, and especially with regards to homesteading, if they're not homesteaders, if they're not people who are interested in this style of living, then don't worry about criticism from people that you wouldn't seek advice from. And in my opinion, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's tougher to accept that criticism from people that you love, um, family members and so forth, people that you would think should be supporting you and encouraging you. But we also can get bound up in that with regards to the nameless, faceless people that we interact with online. And so my charge to you this week is just to keep pressing forward, to keep living your journey, to keep walking your path, and don't worry about criticism from people that you wouldn't seek advice from. Okay, let's go ahead and jump on over to this week's charting the course. Now we are in the third episode of a five-part series with regards to gardening. In episode number five, we started talking about gardening methods and we talked about uh, the various options that exist and hopefully at this point you have chosen one or preferably more than one <laughs> way that you're going to try to grow vegetables uh, on your homestead. On last week's episode, we spent some time talking about making preparations for the harvest and thinking about uh, the things that we are going to do with the vegetables that we grow. Now, you might think that the next logical step is to answer the question, what should I plant? But we're not going to spend a lot of time answering that question. And the reason is that there's really, I think, three main driving factors that are going to help you decide what you should plant on your homestead. And we've really talked about the first two. And those considerations are how you're going to plant your garden, so your gardening method, what you're going to do with the harvest, and then the third one is where you live. As we talked about two episodes ago, if you have if you're going to do vertical gardening, you're probably not going to be planting corn. If you have rather shallow raised beds, maybe eight to 10 inches of soil, you're probably not going to be planting potatoes in your raised beds. Now, as we talked about in last week's episode, if your family likes carrots, you may plant three or four rows of carrots, but if your family doesn't like peas, you're not going to plant a single pea. If you aren't sure whether or not your family likes kale, then you may only put in one or two kale plants because you're not going to risk 
wasting a lot of garden space on a, on a, on a vegetable that you're not sure your family might like. Beyond that, the last consideration is simply climate, where you live. Here in upstate New York, I'm not going to sp spend a lot of time planting citrus and pineapple. <laughs> I mean, now that, that's a bit of a bizarre example, but it, I think it makes the point that here in upstate New York, what I might grow is going to be different than what you might grow in Georgia, which is much, much different than what you might grow in California or Hawaii or, or, or Florida. So where you live is going to also impact what you can and what you should grow. So I don't know what gardening method you're going to use. I don't know what your family likes to eat. I don't know what your capabilities are from the standpoint of preserving the harvest. And I certainly don't know where you live. Those are all questions you're going to need to ask yourself and answer yourself. And so there's really not much more I can say about uh, what should I plant besides what I've already said. And so on this episode, what I want to do is spend some time answering the question, where should I get my seed? As I thought about this, I, I, I think there's four major ways that you can acquire seeds. If I missed one, let me know. Send me an email, thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com and let me know what I missed. But I think there's four primary ways that you can get seeds. Two of them are common ways and are ways that I have gotten seeds. And two of them are a little bit more maybe advanced or not quite so common methods of acquiring seeds. And they're not ones that I have personally experienced. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but they certainly are viable ways to get seeds. So what are those four ways? Well, you can buy them at the store. And I think everybody is aware of that. Even if you're new to gardening, you've probably walked past a seed display uh, at some point in your life at Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, Target, your local uh, hardware store or home improvement store. Um, you've probably walked past a seed display in a store. The second way is that you can order them through a catalog or online, and that may be something that is a new concept to you. Um, you may not be aware of that if you are new to gardening, uh, but you certainly can request catalogs, and you can. there are websites that are just online-only options where you can order seeds and have them shipped to your house. The third option is to take part in a seed swap or a seed exchange where uh, local gardeners get together and they literally do as it suggests. They swap seeds. Um, and some people will do it uh, online. Some homesteading groups will swap seeds as well. But uh, you bring seeds, they bring seeds, and you swap varieties, and uh, everybody goes away happy. And then the last way is to be a seed saver. So you might grow some squash or pumpkins and you save some of those seeds so that you can plant those the following year. Each one of those uh, methods have benefits and each one of them have drawbacks. I don't think there's a perfect situation or, or a perfect solution for every situation. I think sometimes it's going to make more sense to buy them from the store. Sometimes it may make more sense to order them through a catalog. It kind of depends on your situation. But why am I going to spend a lot of time on this? Well, one of the things that uh, happens this time of year is that if you have requested seed catalogs before or you've ordered from a particular vendor in the past, those seed catalogs start arriving this time of year. And I see those uh, pictures of those seed catalogs showing up on the Facebook groups and in the forums. And it seems like every year there are big battles over where people buy their seeds. People become very, very passionate about where other people should acquire their seeds. And I, it's almost ridiculous, um, but it happens every year. A lot of it has to do with GMO and hybrid seeds and whether or not they're good or bad. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that subject on this episode, but in a future episode, I am going to give you my opinions with regards to GMOs and hybrids and kind of how we approach things here on 3B Farm and Homestead. But you do have people who are very, very zealous, very, very passionate about a particular way to get seeds. 
either you have to save, save seeds or you have to buy from vendor XYZ or you shouldn't buy from if this vendor or what. And I think all of that is quite frankly malarkey. My opinion is I want to see people buying seeds. I want to see people planting their own gardens and growing their own vegetables and preserving their own harvest. And quite frankly, I don't care where you get your seeds to do that. Now, I think there are some places that are better than others, certainly. And there's places where I get my seeds from that I have been very, very happy with. But at the end of the day, I don't care what you plant. I just want to see you plant something. I don't know. That's really, I, I think that's the important thing. Because the more you plant, the more you harvest, the more self-sufficient, self-reliant, sustainable you are, the better off I think everybody is. But some people may never become a seed saver, and that's okay. I haven't arrived at seed saver status. Don't know if I ever will. Don't care. Right now, I'm happy buying seeds, planting seeds. I've thought about saving a few seeds. Haven't gotten there. Don't know if I will. Not really all that worried about it. Don't think it makes me any more or less of a homesteader. Definitely a viable option. Something I haven't done. But again, to me, I, I think each one of these methods or, or ways of acquiring seeds have benefits, drawbacks. Let's talk about that. So buying seed at a store. What are some of the benefits to buying seed at a store? Well, the first one is convenience. You walk in, you pick up what you need, and you walk out. Now, hopefully, you pay for it before you walk out. <laughs> I'm not advocating stealing. But again, you walk in, you, you, you grab a pack of beans, a, maybe a pack of uh, carrots, and you walk out, you go plant them in your garden, and bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Convenient. The second is that it could be more cost effective. So let's say you ordered uh, a bunch of vegetable seeds online, and you're out planting in your garden, and you come up short because maybe you miscalculated and you need a few more beans to finish out a row. Now, it doesn't make any sense for you to wait to order them through the, the seed catalog to get them shipped to you, um, but it also may be cheaper for you to go buy them at the store. Because let's say the, 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 the packet of beans is a buck forty-nine at Lowe's, and maybe you can get that same packet of beans online from a vendor for 99 cents. But a lot of those seed catalogs, seed vendors, have a minimum order quantity. And so if you order that 99 cent packet of beans and have them shipped to you, uh, there may be a $4 shipping charge on top of that. So that packet of beans has now cost you $4.99 where you could have gone down to the hardware store and picked it up for a buck forty-nine. So it can be more cost effective depending on what you're doing. Now there are some some uh, seed suppliers like Baker Creek that tout that they offer free shipping on everything. But if you look at the cost of a packet of seeds from Baker Creek, a lot of their stuff is like three bucks a packet versus a buck 49 at Lowe's or Home Depot. So just saying it could be more cost effective to order or buy it at the store. A third benefit to buying at the store, and this is in particular if you're buying them through a mom and pop shop or um, a dedicated home and garden center that's local to you is that you have more likelihood of buying seed that is going to do well in your area, in your geographic location. I don't know if that's necessarily as true for the seeds that you buy at Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart and stuff like that because they're just going to be putting on the shelf what the distributor sent to them. But I do think that your mom and pop shops are probably going to put in a little bit more thought and order in varieties that are better suited to your area. A downside to uh, buying at the store is a lack of variety. Most places are going to have a couple of uh, maybe varieties of cucumber, a couple of uh, varieties of broccoli, a handful of tomatoes, a handful of peppers, but you're not going to have the, 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 the sheer number of varieties that you would have when you order through a catalog or through a website. Also, if GMO, non-GMO seed or organic seed is important to you, your, again, your selection is probably going to be limited, although we are seeing more and more of that 
at least I've been seeing that more, more and more of that locally in the stores, but still the variety is not the same as what you would get ordering it through a catalog. Buying seed at your local, you know, your, your Lowe's Home Depot or your local hardware store, your local feed store can also cost you more. Because let's say you're going to plant four or five rows of carrots. Well, you can order in bulk through the catalog. You can order in bulk through a seed company, whereas you're going to be buying it packet by packet at, uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot. And so for the same number of seeds, it could cost you quite a bit more if you buy it at the store. Another downside to depending on a store to provide you with your seed is that generally speaking, they only carry seed during a particular time of the year. Um, and generally speaking, that's in the spring. And so let's say you are going to plant a fall garden and you need uh, maybe spinach. You're gonna plant spinach in your fall garden. Uh, by the time you go to the store to get your spinach seeds, if you didn't think about this in the spring, they probably aren't going to have seeds in stock anymore. They're going to have moved on to the next season. The, I, I think the last down, uh, downside to buying at the store, and this in particular is probably if you're buying from a discount retailer like a Family Dollar or a Dollar General or a Big Lots, is you may be buying older seed. A lot of times those companies are going to have bought out last year's stock and they're gonna be selling last year's stock this year. Now, what many people don't realize is that you can save seed from year to year. There's nothing wrong with that. But as you save seed from year to year, your germination rates can be impacted. And so um, maybe whereas fresh seed might have a 90% germination rate. Now it's something that's set around for a year. Maybe it's only a 75% germination rate. So just keep that in mind. It may not be the freshest seed possible. That's not to say that the uh, online seed sellers aren't going, their seed vendors aren't necessarily going to be selling quote unquote old seed. Um, I order a lot from Fedco and periodically they will sell last year's seed and I don't necessarily see anything wrong with that. But if you're a market gardener and you are relying on this for your income, then you want the highest germination rates possible. You want the freshest seed possible. And so, but if you're a market gardener, you're probably not going to be buying from Lowe's and Home Depot anyhow. All right. The next option is online or via a catalog. Benefits to that, again, is the sheer variety. Um, you'll have hundreds of varieties of tomatoes and, and peppers and, and so forth. It's just amazing the, the, the number of varieties that you're going to have access to if you are ordering online or through a catalog. There's also a good chance that it will be cheaper. You can buy in bulk um, and so it may cost you less and especially if you meet that minimum order quantity where you get the free shipping. And as we talked about you probably are going to be getting fresher seed. The downside though to ordering through uh, a catalog or ordering online is that the seed that they sell is not always suited for your climate. You may see very, very beautiful pictures of a particular vegetable, but you probably aren't gonna, or you may not be able to grow that in your area. And I had that happen to me a couple of years ago with some lima beans. I ordered some lima beans, uh, planted them, had beautiful vines, very luscious vines, and didn't get a single lima bean. And I was kind of perplexed. I didn't understand what I had done wrong. It was my first year growing lima beans, actually, and I thought, well, maybe I did something wrong. This year, I planted two different kinds of lima beans, and they did very well. So I, I wasn't quite sure what I had done wrong two years ago until I got this year's seed catalog. And as I was reading through this year's seed catalog, I noticed a phrase that I hadn't noticed two years ago. And that was that that seed is not adapted for growing in northern climates. Well, duh, Brian, you live in a northern climate. Now, I don't know what it is about northern climates that that variety doesn't like. 
It may be that we don't have enough hot days. It may be that we don't have enough cool days. It may be that we don't have enough rain or too much. I don't know what it is that that variety needs, but what I do know is that variety is not adapted for growing in northern climates. And so sometimes, uh, and not every seed uh, catalog is as good at letting you know that as the catalog I had. But just because it's in a seed catalog doesn't necessarily mean that it's suited for your climate. Another downside to ordering online or through a catalog is that there's uh, too many options. Um, and so you can kind of get paralysis by analysis. You get overwhelmed. And am I ordering the right seed? Am I ordering the right variety? Is this going to do well in my climate? And so you can order too many seeds. Or you may just throw up your hands and say, there's too many varieties, I can't figure it out. And then the last uh, downside to ordering online or through a catalog is that it can take you some time to get it. And so if you're in the middle of planting your garden and you realize that you've run out of some seed, you're probably not going to want to wait to have that seed shipped to you. So what about a seed swap or a seed exchange? Again, I've not done this yet. But if you're participating in a local seed swap or seed exchange, a benefit is that the seed that you're going to get is probably going to be well suited for your area. You also have the opportunity to steward or to propagate an heirloom variety, something that uh, potentially may have been uh, stewarded by people in your area for generations. And obviously it's going to be very cost effective to swap seed for seed. But a downside to this approach to getting seeds is what if you don't have any seeds to swap? How do you know that the seed that you're getting is actually the varieties that the person says they are? Now, I don't think people are out there spending a lot of time scamming at seed swaps. Don't get me wrong. But there is a certain level of uncertainty that you have uh, with regards to the seed. Is the person who is swapping the seed, someone who knew uh, good practices, for example, with regards to how close to plant uh, different varieties so that you're not getting cross-pollination and perhaps ending up with what you thought was a sweet pepper, but it was cross-pollinated with a hot pepper, and now you have kind of this hybrid hot sweet pepper that you're not quite sure what you're getting. And finally, um, you're not quite sure whether or not the seed you're getting is going to germinate. How old is it? Has it been stored well? Has it been well taken care of? And so you certainly would not want to bet the farm, shall we say, on this, uh, on the viability of this seed. The last method of getting seed is through saving seed. And I would say out of all of the methods, this is certainly the one that is the most self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable methodology of getting seed. Uh, and it's certainly the most cost-effective. You are harvesting seeds from stuff that you've already planted. It doesn't cost you any money. It might cost you a little bit of time. Uh, but certainly it is going to be the most cost-effective, the most self-reliant, self-sufficient, and sustainable way of uh, acquiring seed. But there's some downsides to it as well. The first one is, is that you have to have seed to start with. So you've got to get that seed somewhere <laughs> so that you have seeds to save. There also is a bit of a learning curve to seed saving. I don't think it's extremely difficult, but it is something that does take a little bit of time to understand how to do it, how to um, dry the seed properly, how to store the seed properly, and certainly some things are going to be easier uh, to save seeds from than others. For example, um, okra is something that's going to be very easy to save seeds from. Pumpkins and squash are something that uh, are, are vegetables that it's going to be easy to save seeds from. But things like cherry tomatoes or uh, grape tomatoes or even some small pepper varieties might be a little bit more challenging and then there are other things even more difficult than that uh, to save seeds from. And another big uh, factor is crop failure. If your beans don't produce that year, then you're not going to have any seeds to plant the following year. 
And so th those are some of the drawbacks to seed saving. So again, I have not participated in a seed swap and I have not done seed saving. So I'm not going to really talk any more about those. But I have bought seeds both from the store and online through catalogs and websites. I have used a variety of catalogs and websites. And generally speaking, I've had great success with every vendor that I have used. When I first started gardening, I used Vermont Bean Seed Company because that's who my grandfather had used for years and years. And quite frankly, I had good success with them. Uh, a few years later, a friend of mine at work introduced me to a company out of Maine called Fedco, which is a cooperative of independent seed growers. And so I started ordering from them. And currently, they are my preferred seed provider. But I've also ordered from places like Baker Creek. I've ordered from MI Gardener. I've ordered from uh, Hudson Valley Seed Company. I've ordered from Row 7 Seed Company, which is a relatively new company that's doing some experimental varieties. Uh, I've ordered from Totally Tomato, a variety of different places that I have ordered seeds from, um, depending on the circumstances, the varieties that I wanted to try. And overall, I have been very satisfied with every one of them. For a few years, when we had lost access to the large garden down at my grandfather's house, and we were now only doing the small number of raised beds that we had here at our house, I stopped ordering online altogether and just started buying seeds um, at our local mom and pop feed store and had good success with that. Well, I do like Fedco seeds, and again, the bulk of my seed order does go to Fedco seeds. Many people may not enjoy their catalog. Their catalog is black and white. It's uh, not pretty like um, Baker Creek's by any stretch of the imagination, and it does get a little bit political, to be honest with you. But based on my value proposition, <laughs> uh, I, I still will continue to order from Fedco until I determine that something else is a better option for me. So how should you go about determining a seed supplier? Quite honestly, I would say order as many catalogs as you can and then pick one or two or three. Try out the different seed suppliers and see which one you like the best, and then go from there. I don't think there's any right answer to this question. Uh, some people love Baker Creek. Personally, and this is just my personal opinion, and please don't get mad at me, but I think Baker Creek is very expensive. When you look at how much they charge for the seed packets, yes, their catalog is beautiful, but you're paying a lot for those pretty pictures. I mean, that's just my opinion. I'm not hating on Baker Creek. Don't get me wrong. Beautiful catalog. People have had great success with their uh, growing vegetables from Baker Creek, but it's not my preference. Uh, I'm a cheapskate. So when I did my value proposition and I compared the different seed companies, Baker Creek was by far and away the most expensive one. Uh, MI Gardener is a great option. They have no catalog. So check them out online and see what uh, we'll see what you think. Luke's uh, YouTube um, channel is a wealth of information. And so maybe you want to place some orders like I have simply because you want to support Luke's efforts in providing people with great information on his YouTube channel. But there are two places that I seriously recommend that you do not use to buy seeds. The first one is eBay and the second one is Amazon. Just trust me on this one. Don't get your seeds there. Get them from reputable seed companies, seed suppliers. I think you will be much happier if you do that. All right, that's the end of this week's Charting the Course. I went a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but I think it is all good stuff. Uh, and again, from my perspective, it really doesn't matter where you get your seeds. As long as you get good seeds, you plant your seeds, you're on your journey. You're planning the stuff that you like. You've got a plan for the harvest. Do you? I don't care where you get your seeds. I want you planning and harvesting on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. 
All right, let's round out this week's episode with a homestead hack. And this homestead hack has to do with storing your seeds. So let's say you buy a bunch of seeds uh, and after you plant your garden, you have seeds left over like I do every year. How are you going to keep those seeds? Well, what I have found is that a small plastic toolbox, I think I've got a Stanley toolbox, is perfect for storing those packets of seeds. So I took the tray actually out of it. I don't even know whatever happened to the tray, don't care. Um, and then I keep the packets in that in the order of the name of the vegetable. So I've got the cucumbers all together, I've got the tomatoes all together, I've got the broccoli all together and so on and so forth. And then I just keep it in a cool area. I don't worry, some people say put it in the freezer. I've never done that. I just keep it in a cool area in my toolbox, it's protected and it's well organized and then it's easy to carry it out to the garden and I can open it up and I can thumb through, I can pull out the vegetable that I want to plant and then when I'm done I can put it back in and it just makes it really, really easy to keep track of the seeds that I have on hand, to store them and to carry them around. A simple hack folks, but a plastic, a small plastic toolbox. Now, I don't know, maybe a metal one would work, but mine just happens to be a plastic one and it works well. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.